We've got everybody checked in and ready to roll. Go ahead, you're open to vote. Three. Put it over the slate now. Two, one. Take camera one. Go, John. Welcome to Washington Post Live. That was uh, quite an intro. My gosh, you should probably <laughs> just leave it right there. I've hit the big time. Washington Post, I can like go home and tell my parents what I did today. Between Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Washington Post Live itself, we are now reaching hundreds of thousands of homes across all 50 states. The power of this platform is it takes people into the world of ideas. Audience members of Washington Post Live are part of the conversation. Audience or viewer question from George Kralovec from Virginia asks, now that we have the Inflation Reduction Act, do we still need a price on carbon? Whether it's with cancer scientists or politicians. You know, this panel, I think, was originally called, you know, two women against Putin. It really should be three women against Putin. <laughs> and so The better way to get things done, as I've demonstrated, is by putting a group together and negotiating something that's good for both uh, points of view. I think Washington Post Live has given us as a newspaper a, a new platform, a common meeting ground when they're sitting in their own space, there is a sense of, of ownership and comfort. It's great that you guys have you know, expanded into these new formats to give people a, you know, a greater ability to have a, a longer conversation. So I look forward to talking to you today. And their individuality comes through more so than just their title. Thank you for being the agents and the warriors of the light and truth. That is the lock from the night of the burglary. Well, Jeff Bezos bought it at, at an, an auction. auction. Right. And right. we're trying to find out how much Bezos <laughs> paid. Right. Come, back, come back next week. I'm so grateful to be on a platform like the Washington Post. I have, I subscribe, I read, I love the Washington oh, Post. Thank you. We need films like this. So thank you very much, Stephen Lynn. It's been great to talk to you. Thank you, Michelle, big fan. Thanks for talking to us. I cannot thank you all enough. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Patty Stonecipher, the interim CEO here at The Washington Post. I'm happy to welcome you here and online for a very special conversation with our former executive editor, Marty Barron. Some of you in this room worked at The Post when Marty was at the helm, and all of us, no doubt, read The Post during this historic period of leadership when The Post broke countless stories and took power to account and earned 10 Pulitzer Prizes along the way. In 2013, just a few months into Marty's tenure here, the company was purchased by Jeff Bezos, a dramatic change after nearly eight decades under the leadership of the beloved Graham family. And then just a few years later, Donald J. Trump became the president and he labeled the press an enemy of the people and called journalists the lowest form of life. Marty's response to the rhetoric was straightforward, and you'll read a lot about that here. We are not at war with the administration. We're at work. In his new book, Collision of Power, Marty details what it was like for him to lead a global newsroom during these pivotal chapters in our shared history. We're excited to welcome Marty back to talk about how he sees the role of a free press in defending the truth and holding power to account in our democracy. We're also delighted to welcome back the noted author and editor, Tina Brown, who will be interviewing Marty right after this video. We understand what our mission is. We understand what our purpose is. Uh, we're not going to waver in pursuing that. And that also means that we don't cave under pressure.
to take the Washington Post from being a great local paper, which was a very successful strategy for decades, and transform it into a great national and global paper. While the campaign is over, our work on this movement is now really just beginning. Everybody. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here today talking with really a legend in journalism, one who's been called the tribal chieftain of American journalism. That's obeisance. Okay. So this is a bit of a homecoming for you today, Marty. It right? is. It is indeed. It's great it, to be back. It is. So um, we're actually here in what is now the capital of mayhem, right? Because as we speak, Kevin McCarthy just ousted as House Speaker, former Trump, President Trump officially nominated to be Speaker. And of course, funds have been withdrawn, uh, suspended from the short-term funding bill from Ukraine. So, I mean, it, it, it's an extraordinarily turbulent times. Do you think it's become even harder to be the editor of The Post since you left? Uh, I don't know, it seemed pretty hard while I was there. <laughs> I'm not sure it can get much harder. Uh, so I would say it's about the same. I mean, I, I have to believe it's, got, it's about the same. I mean, look, we had to deal with Trump as a president uh, candidate unlike any we'd ever seen before and a president unlike any we'd ever seen before. And, um, and we were struggling with sort of how, how to cover his campaign and how to cover his presidency. Um, and uh, people have a little bit of practice at that these days. But um, so I don't know. I'm not sure it's gotten harder. I mean, the country's gotten messier, uh, that's for sure. Uh, and politics has gotten messier. And it's more chaotic. Uh, and we don't know where that's going to lead. Um, but well, I don't know about Well, let's rewind. Let's rewind to those early days and talk about that incredible dinner at the Trump White House in June 2017 when you went to meet the president for the first time. You didn't, hadn't actually ever met him before. And you went with uh, Jeff Bezos, you went with Fred Ryan, then the publisher and the editor, Fred Hyatt. Uh, just walk us through the wild scene. Uh, sure. Uh, first of all, I mean, I, I, I don't know why none of our reporters discovered that, but uh, they'll have to tell me here. Uh, some of them are here. Uh, so um, Fred wanted, uh, felt that it was appropriate for us to, to meet with Trump uh, that, uh, here at the Washington Post, biggest newspaper in the nation's capital and one of the biggest in the country. and. Um, and Trump was here, and he proposed that Bezos be part of that uh, that meeting, and wanted me and Fred Hyatt to come along. Um, and uh, I was very—I mean, I was super nervous about that meeting. Uh, I wasn't really in favor of it. Um, uh, I thought that Trump would interpret it as Bezos actually being able to influence coverage, that he had a hand in it, uh, because there he was with with me and with um, certainly he could have a hand on the editorial page, but with the news department, that was something entirely different. So. And Trump being such a transactional person, I, I assumed that he would think that having dinner with him was a gift to us, uh, and therefore somehow we should repay this gift. Um, and uh, but anyway, he was you know he was charming in a superficial way when we went there. Um, it was I mean it didn't strike me at all as authentic, and it certainly wasn't authentic. Um, but uh, you know, he started going on. He did almost all the talking. Surprise! Uh, so uh, he did almost all the talking. I sat there impassively. Jared Kushner sat there impassively, um, and um, but he was mostly talking at, at Jeff, uh, really. Uh, but he would take digs at the at the post all the time, and I was sitting to his left, and he would always like you know elbow me like this. Kept jabbing you. And I was so tempted uh, to like go like this. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it is the president of the United States, you know. Uh, uh, so I, I held back. So, um, and, um, 
And, you know, he talked about the same things that he always talks about, about how he had beaten the Clinton machine, how he'd beaten the Bushes, how he'd beaten all these supposedly great candidates of the Republican Party, um, and, um, you know, uh, all, all the stuff that he had accomplished, uh, mostly imagined at that point. Uh, and, um, and then, you know, he would uh, talk about people he thought was great, and then he'd talk about people he thought were terrible. Um, and. Um, and it sort of went on like that with him just rambling on. And um, uh, so, and at the end, you know, it was, uh, he was basically talking to, to Bezos and, well, Melania was there as well. And, um, and then he talked about how much Melania liked shopping with Amazon, uh, which was kind of, <laughs> it was kind of bizarre after he'd gone through the entire campaign talking about how terrible Amazon was. And then, you know, it was a bit of a commercial for Amazon. And then Jeff offered himself as his, you know, to be his per her personal customer service rep. Um, um, uh, I'm surprised she didn't take advantage of it, but the, uh, in any event, so it was, you know, and then he showed us around uh, the, the White House, and um, uh, I'm not an expert on White House history, uh, Fred is, um, and uh, apparently some of it wasn't terribly accurate, by the way, uh, the way that he described the White House, so um, the White House history, uh, and then we went on our merry way, uh, and uh, well, not so merry, but we then we then met well, afterwards. I, I didn't really you? talk about this in the book, but we went and met afterwards uh, um, to talk with with Jake Carney uh, and Chris Karate was there, and we talked, compared notes uh, at one of the clubs nearby, and um, talked about all of that. So go ahead. What was your conversation in the car on the way back, if I may? Well, ask uh, we weren't in the car because it was it's close enough. But um, so we went back to this with this club and compared and compared notes and. Yeah, it was a bit of an eye-rolling event, of course. So, um, uh, but I think we were just sort of astonished at just the, the scene of it all and didn't quite know what to make of it. And how um, did it shape, I mean, how did it sort of impact you in terms of the way you saw him and the way you covered him? Did it make any sort of lasting impact in the way you felt you were going to? Yeah, I mean, I immediately, thought, I immediately thought that uh, he held, at one point he held up a Rasmussen poll, which is generally the most favorable uh, toward, the, toward uh, Trump. And it was 47% uh, and uh, that that was his uh, current polling. polling. Um, and he said and what he had kind of won with because he didn't win the popular vote. And he said, I can win with this. Um, and it was clear to me that he, um, that he intended to win with that, that he was going to be a president strictly for his base uh, and not for anybody else. And my sense was that he imagined that he's not gonna win over any converts, but uh, among his base, he could appeal to them and get them to turn out in, in substantial numbers and that he could win again and that he was going to run his, his government by constantly appealing to that, that 47%. Yeah, well, that was a pretty chilling uh, sort of, uh, you know, omen for what was to come forth. So he unleashed, of course, an unmitigated onslaught, really, against the Post for four years, right? Uh, and during that time, as he tried to caricature you as a lying partisan, you coined the we are not at war, we're at work mantra, which actually was then uh, posted up in, in the newsroom. But it really was a war as well, wasn't it? Yes, you were at work, but it was a war. Um, I mean, you were editor of the Post at a time when you had a president who once told, according to Glenn Kessler, 189 lies in one day. It's yeah, like hard to keep up. Hard Poor to Glenn up. and his team. I mean, they were so busy. Um. <laughs> so it's just how do you? I can imagine how hard that must have been as the editor to kind of oversee how you chase those 189 lies and keep making an impact with the reader. Yeah, I mean, I think so, and it was tough on the staff for sure. Um, I mean, it's like, how do you deal with this? Uh, first of all, I mean, there was the question of how do we describe what he's saying? I mean, uh, we were not accustomed to saying the president lied. That wasn't something that the, the Post had done traditionally or most major news organizations hadn't done that. And the truth is that we didn't really know whether he even knew that what he was saying wasn't true. I mean, that doesn't speak so well of him, by the way, to think to actually be deluded about what the truth is. Um, but, uh, but also, you know, uh, he could have been just somebody who, and I won't use the word, but he was just sort of BS. Uh, and just didn't care whether it was true or not, just making it, up on, making it up on the spot. But at some point, it was clear that he knew that what he was saying wasn't, uh, wasn't true. Uh, and we started to use the word lie, and it became more apparent over time that he clearly knew that what he was saying was false, and we used it more, more frequently. Uh, but, you know, um, 
there's so many things to cover with him. I mean, these policies that he was implementing, the way that he was behaving within the White House, uh, um, and just sort of crazy behavior and the internecine warfare within the White House as well. And so um, uh, we couldn't just focus on his lies because that would be a full-time full -time occupation. So, um, and, but you know, it was a big part of covering him. Well, I mean, Trump told 60 Minutes, I discredit the media and demean you all so that when you write negative stories about me, no one will believe them. It sounds almost demonic, really, when you read that now. Uh, how much tr tr damage do you think that Trump did do to the press? And do you think that the press has got any better at contending with it since? Yeah, I would take out the almost word, by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, it, it was clearly cynic totally cynical. Um, I mean, I, I think we struggled with him at the beginning. I mean, first of all, I think our, one of our biggest mistakes was actually before Trump actually announced uh, that he was running for president. We just didn't adequately take the measure of the, the level of grievance in the country. I mean, there were a lot of people, and there are a lot of people struggling in this country, and, and they had uh, real grievances against um, the so-called elites, uh, particularly in Washington and particularly against the press. And, and it led to um, a candidate like Trump, and I, we, didn't we didn't anticipate that. Well, that was uh, a big miss, wasn't it, really, of the paper, well, that you didn't big... miss, you really missed that depth, depth of feeling and that Trump was such a surprise. I mean, why do you think right. that was, that actually? Well, I think, well, actually, why? Because we weren't out in the country taking the measure of what, what people's sentiments were. Uh, but once he actually declared as a candidate, I think we did a very good job here uh, at exploring his, um, uh, his life and his career to going in depth. I mean, we assigned, we did a whole book on it, Trump Revealed, because we had done a series. Um, and we went really deep on him. Uh, we enlisted another 20 reporters um, to, to work on that book. Uh, and when Bob Woodward disclosed that publicly at a, it was a conference of real estate developers or something like that. Uh, it was a weird place to come from, but, but uh, Trump seized on that. The right-wing media seized on that. He attacked Bezos for that, that we were just like going after him. Um, and, uh, but you know, that his supporters, none of that really mattered to them. I mean, they, when he would talk about, I mean, even with his announcement, if he's talking about uh, rapists coming from Mexico, they think of somebody who's uh, gonna do something about the border. Whether, whether, it sound, whether it sounds racist or is racist or all of that, that's how we react. That's not how they react. When he talks about keeping Muslims out of the country, um, you know, we look at the constitutional issues involved there. But uh, other people are saying, oh, well, he's going to do something about terrorism. And they're seeing it through a different prism than, uh, than journalists are um, and, other, and the way that other people in Washington are. And I think it's really important that we we understand why people are seeing it through that prism. And so I do think people are still struggling with how to, how to cover him. I mean, I think there have been some recent really big mistakes. The interview uh, on CNN, a terrible mistake. Uh, I think the more recent one with Meet the Press, I think that's a mistake. I mean, it's just uh, doing an interview with him like that is just giving him a platform. He controls the conversation. And you know, more and more, what we ought to be doing is saying, what would its tr second Trump administration actually look like? Who would he appoint uh, you know, to be members of his cabinet? Uh, what kinds of uh, policies would he implement at the beginning? Clearly, it would be a vengeance tour. I mean, he would be targeting the Department of Justice, the FBI, the press, courts, you name it. Um, the Post has done some of that work. I would like to see, see more of that, and I hope that there's more of that in the works. Mm -hmm. uh, what is this a second Trump administration, if there is one, uh, really going to mean for this country and for our democracy. It's a good assignment, guys. <laughs> I certainly like to read it. So, um, of course, when you first arrived at the Post in 2013, Obama was or, was still president, right? Yeah. He didn't much like the press either. No, he didn't. Uh, how was covering Obama compared to covering Trump? Well, I was only here for a short period of mm -hmm. that time, but uh, they weren't very welcoming to us. I mean, look, we even wanted to, I think we tried for two years to get a, like a farewell interview with him uh, just to, you know, uh, he had been in office for you know two terms, and we were trying to get a substantial interview with him, and we were never granted that interview. They wanted nothing to do with us, Good. mainly because they knew that we weren't going to ask so just softball questions. All of those interviews in that last stretch of the Obama administration were with outlets that were clearly going to, they were essentially allies of his, and uh, were going to ask him the, the softest of softball questions, and that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, when you arrived, also the post was forecast to lose forty million dollars. Uh, its seventh straight year of revenue decline. 
the number of key kings in the newsroom, I'm told, I learned that phrase today, was at an all time high. Were you just, did you think that your role was going to be to manage decline? I mean, or did you have a, a real vision for how to reverse the decline when you came in? Uh, no, I can't claim that I had a vision for it because I wasn't sure what the model should be. I mean, I was interviewed, of course, by senior executives here at the Post. Um, and uh, I remember having uh, breakfast or lunch with Steve Hills and uh, he asked me a bunch of questions and then we were leaving and I said, well, can I ask you a question? And he said, sure. And I said, so what's your strategy for getting through this? He goes, we're still trying to figure that out. <laughs> it's not, it, was not, uh, it was not really optimistic. So I worried that I was going to have to continue to manage the decline. Uh, in my first year, Catherine Weymouth told me that she was going to go easy on me. Uh, I would only have to reduce staff by 35 people. Um, and we had a staff of about 580 when I got there. Uh, and then uh, as we, the summer came, we were starting to anticipate you know, planning for the next year's budget. And it looked like I would probably have to cut another 50 or more uh, people. Uh, and then, uh, so no, there was no plan for, I mean, a, no good plan, that's for sure, for getting out of it. And, um, and that was made clear to, to Bezos after he actually acquired it. When we met at his house in Medina, in Washington, um, and in his boathouse, um, which is bigger than most of our boathouses, houses, but um, <laughs> um, it's, um, I don't even have a body of water, but uh, so in any event, um, it was, um, uh, you know, they presented him with a whole memo to make clear to him that they, they were actually wondering whether he really knew how bad things were. It's kind of amazing. Uh, so they presented him with a whole memo that explained just how bad things, how awful things were. And it had a couple of notes of optimism in there just to make it look like we weren't total pessimists. But, um, um, and they handed it to him and he uh, read it silently while we all sat there. Uh, uh, Tremoring, you know, with our, tr you know, trembling, and it was like, and then he got up, and Steve said, uh, "Are you leaving?" <laughs> it's like, and then he went to get some water, and he came back, and he said, "I don't, I don't get discouraged that easily," and, um, and he said, "So you're right, we have to grow, so let's figure out how to do that," uh, but we did not have a plan uh, at the post prior to that for how to grow. We were, in, we were in the mode of managing decline. But obviously your, your main focus was just the editorial quality of the paper. And I mean, you say, of course, rightly, I mean, the obvious that uh, the best way to lift a newspaper's fortunes is to get some really, really big stories. At the Miami Herald, you had the incredible, uh, you know, uh, Elian Gonzalez story at the Globe. Uh, you famously broke and owned that the whole story of the Catholic Church's cover up of, uh, of sexual abuse, wonderfully celebrated in the, movie Spotlight. So what do you think really, what would you consider the big fortune lifting beginning of the big scoop run at the Washington Post? Yeah, well, um, so happened that uh, Bart Gelman, former staffer at the Post, longtime staffer at the Post, walks in and tells us that he uh, basically will be getting his hands on the most, or already had his hands on the most classified uh, documents in the US government that, that disclosed a widespread uh, surveillance regime uh, by the intelligence agencies here that actually captured a lot of private information of American citizens as well. And so um, uh, the question was, were we willing to publish it? Um, he had already, he was working on contract with Time Magazine and had broached this with them. Uh, and the response that he got was not encouraging uh, to him uh, in his conversations with the editors and the lawyers there. And so he brought it here. Um, he had talked to Jeff Lean, who was our, is the investigations editor here, and um, asked whether he thought I would be receptive to this. And, um, and so they came in and we talked about it and we decided to proceed. I mean, I wasn't, I'd never really dealt with stories like that. I mean, I hadn't dealt with stories like that at all, for that matter. I mean, I had been an editor of major regional publications, but not, I wasn't dealing with in matters of national security. And, um, you know, you had to think hard about it. I mean, we des I decided to, to go with it. And I said that after our first meeting when, where we discussed all the issues, or at least a substantial number of the issues. But then when I went home, I was like, gee, what did I just do here? Uh, so, you know, I, th I was thinking about it more. And I, was, I actually made a copy of the Espionage Act of 1917. Um, 
it's not the liveliest reading, but it was really important at the time. And I did highlight the things where there could be huge penalties against the post, there could be imprisonment, all of that. Um, but I thought about it, and it was just, um, this was a level of um, an invasion of Americans' privacy in a way that none of us could have imagined. And, um, and there had been, of course, no public debate about it. And the question is, how far does that go over time? And I felt that the public did need to know about it. And um, that if it even became a broader and deeper surveillance regime, I mean, and we didn't disclose it, we would be responsible, I would be responsible for, for not having disclosed that to the American people. So we did go ahead with that story, and of course it was huge. Uh, the Guardian uh, in England had, had that as well, and we were very competitive with them. Um, and, um, you know, we had a procedure for how to, how to report on those stories and the conversations that we should have with, um, with the intelligence agencies, but uh, we went ahead and all of a sudden the Post was, at the center of the conversation and the, uh, in the, the world, for, for that matter. It was, yeah, and uh, I bet it, that felt very good. <laughs> uh, it did, but you know, I mean, this, it, it did, for sure, but, from a, uh, but also you knew you were dealing with just the most sensitive stuff, and I was in Boston at the time of the 9-11 attacks. Two of those planes, uh, the two that hit the World Trade Center towers, uh, came from Boston. Uh, the father of one of our staffers, uh, David Filipoff, was killed in one of those planes. I went to the memorial service. I was pretty sensitive to, um, you know, the risks of terrorism. So it wasn't like, well, we just need a good story. Um, but it was an important story and one we needed to pursue. Of course, another huge thing that happened under your watch was going to bed at night knowing that one of your correspondents was moldering in an Iranian jail. Jason Rezaian was finally released in 2016 after a year and a half in prison, thanks in part to some of the intense lobbying work actually that Fred Ryan did. Um, what was it like to live through that and to know that Jason was in prison? And do you have any advice for the journal's leadership in how to get back uh, 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 their missing reporter? Uh, I have talked to them actually. So uh, they did call around and talk to people who have experience with this. Uh, look, I was, it was preposterous that Jason uh, and Yagani, his wife, were picked up. Uh, um, and I mean, he was accused of espionage, of course. And given the system in Iran, um, I was very worried that he could be in prison forever or actually be executed. Uh, and I was, it was just unimaginable for that to happen uh, for someone who, you know, was doing, you know, you know, just journalism in, in Iran. And, um, and so, you know, that was my biggest fear is that that would happen. As far as um, Evan at the Wall Street Journal, uh, it's a similar, similar situation. And what I told them is that they should just be prepared for the long haul. Um, they need to keep the pressure on. They need to keep uh, pushing as much as they can. Uh, I think they're doing that. They're doing really well with that. Um, they're doing the right thing. Um, but um, this notion that these things are gonna resolve themselves in a short period of time, I think is, um, is fantasy. Uh, they won't, and, and that's what I told them, is just keep at it and don't get discouraged. Uh, but you can anticipate that it's probably going to take a long time. Mm -hmm. Let's just talk about Jeff Bezos, because I have to say that he comes out of the book very impressively, actually, because he, he's just so stalwart and engaged and uh, seems to have been, have been very supportive of you. Um, so he'd never owned a newspaper before he bought the Post in 2013. So he was sort of a virgin to this business. How well did his hard-charging you know, tech business principles translate into owning a newspaper? And uh, why do you think he wanted the Washington Post? You know, I mean, um, he says he wanted it. He talks about these three gates that he had to go through. And I've heard it so many times. Um, you know, I mean, the one, is it an important institution? Is it, yeah, that's obvious. It's an important institution, um, things like that. And then he gets to, could I make a difference? Uh, and, um, and then he concludes that uh, he could make a difference because he could give us runway uh, time, a longer time horizon. And certainly that made a big, big difference and that was really helpful. I was always looking, certainly at the beginning, I was looking for some sort of other agenda on his part. Um, everybody assumed that he would have an agenda. I mean, a lot of business people would f for that matter. Uh, but I never saw any evidence of another agenda other than that he believed in the mission of the Washington Post. He believed in the mission of the press, even though he is rightfully the, the subject of uh, tough coverage. Uh, and, um, uh, and that he 
he wanted to, he wanted, he felt that he could do something to help this institution survive and thrive. And, um, and so um, I haven't seen any evidence of anything, anything but that. And uh, I know there are still, you know, plenty of people out there who would doubt that. But um, look, I mean, he came under enormous pressure from the president of the United States, who endeavored to sabotage his business, the source of his wealth, uh, talked about doubling, tripling, and then quadrupling postal rates. Uh, you got the sense that Trump may have been making these numbers up out of thin air. Um, and, um, and then he intervened in the cloud computing contract uh, for Amazon, which Amazon seemed to be the leading bidder for, cloud computing contract for uh, the Defense Department. $10 billion. Um, yeah, they and gave it, they gave it to and Microsoft. They, they gave it to Microsoft and <laughs> then went back for rebidding. But I mean, people were, there was a joke in the business afterwards that it didn't just cost Jeff $250 million to buy the Washington Post. It cost him $10,250,000,000 <laughs> to buy the Washington Post. Uh, and it, look, I mean, he's, he's paid he some bring, price I mean, for that. Aside from the incredible uh, re relief and um, amazing sort of gift to the post of his investment and the wealth yeah. he brought so that you could hire more reporters and so on. What else did he bring to the situation? I mean, well, how, in working with him all the time, what did you get from Be Bezos that wasn't well, just about his money? Yeah, well, the first thing that we got was, um, well, ideas, okay? So ideas are really important. Uh, routinely when we're when the post is covered, I keep saying we, and I've been gone three years, but the, um, the routinely when the post is covered, um, uh, everybody just talks about Bezos' money as if he's just showering the post with money, and everybody here in the newsroom knows that's not true. So, um, so um, it's ideas. He came with a strategy uh, about how we could reverse course, and the first thing he said was, uh, you know, the post has been a local and regional publication, and uh, and that may have been a good strategy for the past, but it's not a good strategy for the present. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have an incredible opportunity here uh, to, um, to turn things around. You're, you can be national and global. You're in the nation's capital, so that's a good base for it. You have the, the name, the Washington Post, which is a name that can be leveraged to a national level, unlike, for example, the other places I've worked, Boston, Los Angeles, Miami, places like that. Can't really be national with a name like that. Um, and then you had a history and a heritage that um, uh, that everybody knows about, even if they've never read a single word from the Washington Post, going back to Watergate, to find who we were, that we were an investigative-oriented organization, that we sh uh, sh shined a light in dark corners, that we held government accountable, all of that. And so that was a lot to work with. And then we lived in a digital era, so we didn't have to deliver a physical paper all over the country. Um, and that we could, if we just get more readers and we would get more subscribers, and the cost of each additional reader and each additional subscriber was uh, essentially zero, uh, the incremental cost of that. Uh, so uh, that, was our, that was our opportunity. And then the question was, well, how do we go about doing that? And we needed to come up with some ideas. Uh, and he asked for our ideas. We went out to, to the Seattle area. He, uh, we presented him with our ideas. And then um, he said, well, what were your parameters for these ideas? And we were like, I just thought they were good ideas. Uh, and, and he said, well, I think we should have parameters. And he said, uh, let me suggest two. Uh, one is what will appeal to a national audience, and then what will appeal to a younger audience? Uh, because if we don't cultivate a younger audience, um, we won't have an audience in the future. You know, we won't have an audience in 20 years. I can tell you, uh, I never heard a publisher, an owner, or anybody talk about 20 years in our business. It's like, it's like, what about next quarter? Uh, was what I was really accustomed to hearing about. Uh, it was refreshing to hear somebody talk about 20 years. Um, and so, um, so I think that was the most critical thing is that he had a strategy. The strategy worked. The initiatives that we put in place most, mostly worked. I mean, the vast majority of them actually worked. And um, that was, I think, what he brought to his willingness to finance that and also to give us some time to let those mm -hmm. things uh, mm -hmm. pay off. Well, of course, you led the post at the time of, of hugely murky information peddling such as the NSA leak and the so-called Steele dossier, uh, which alleged that Russia had compromised on Trump. And it was ultimately totally discredited. So in the book, you, you say you have regrets about the Post coverage of that. So, so talk about your regrets about the coverage of that Steele dossier. The Steele dossier, yeah. Whole look, I mean, I think uh, we, look, we, we did the right thing in investigating that very thoroughly. I mean, I think we had to take that seriously. Uh, we had to investigate it. Uh, we had to chase down every conceivable clue, uh, all of that. Um, 
And that was totally the appropriate thing to do. And so the staff did that. They just, by the way, they just forgot to tell me about the Steele dossier. Uh, so it's like nobody, I didn't even know there was such a thing as a Steele dossier until much later. Uh, but they were chasing down all these clues and, um, and they, weren't, they couldn't find uh, evidence uh, to support what was in the, in the Steele dossier. So, um, you know, so my regret is that once we had done all that work um, and been thorough about it and exhausted all of the avenues, the investigative avenues that we could, that we didn't step back and say, okay, well, maybe this thing just is not true. Uh, and, and then really take a hard look at, at Steele himself and, 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 how, and, and sort of how this gained so much currency uh, in certain segments of the American government and uh, do a hard, hard hitting piece about the problems with the Steele dossier. Um, it's just, you know, I can't say that it's been discredited. It just hasn't been proven, okay? Yeah. That's the problem. There's no yeah. evidence for yeah. it. Uh, so, but, you know, you say, you say in the book that there was quite a lot of conflict in your own staff about that story. The, the well, national security staff there was, yeah. and the political staff yeah. were sort of at odds about it. And you say, yeah. which kind of blew my mind a little bit, you said that you say you weren't clued in on any of it at yeah. quite some time. And I, it feels like it was such a big story. How could you, as the sort of editor-in-chief, not have been engaged in that process? How did, how did Good that question. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, it came up at the at the um, at the uh, Dem at the uh, Democratic National Convention, and um, and I wasn't there, so I'd I'd been there briefly, but I, I went back to D.C. and then um, and I think that people, my guess is that people wanted to check it out to see if there was something substantive to actually tell me about, and um, and then they just kept checking out, and after a certain point, people didn't realize they'd never actually told me about this story um, and that that's the way it happens. I mean, people in the public think there's some grand conspiracy, but, you know, um, newsrooms are not always the best organized um, and the most communicative places in the world. Um, and um, um, and so, you know, I was just kind of left out, left out of the picture on that one. And so and yes, there was conflict on the staff about it, uh, clearly, uh, as I outlined in the book. And reporting that was one of the uh, hardest parts of the book because there was still a lot of sore feelings on there still a lot of sore feelings on the staff about uh, not about, having really done that critical piece about Steele and the whole. Well, no, I mean, just you know, how much faith faith should people have had in the Steele dossier in the first place? Uh, was did people really have any idea who the source was, or was the source credible enough to take this document seriously? Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, the staff in, in Moscow was super skeptical of the whole thing. Uh, and, uh, and so there was a lot of tension on the staff um, about the whole thing. And, and so, um, uh, and that was, I had to report that out actually, because while I was aware of the tension, uh, after when I finally heard about the Steele dossier, um, that I didn't know the dimensions of it. I didn't know the details of that tension, and I needed to report that out. And, mm -hmm. and that was one of the harder bits of reporting for the mm -hmm. book because there was still some of that tension on the staff, and people were very sensitive to how they might be portrayed in mm -hmm. the book. Well, speaking of tension, Marty, the, la the last quarter of the book, uh, you're not a happy warrior, one senses. Um, uh, in fact, you seem quite at odds with your own newsroom uh, for some of that period. I mean, talk to me about that time at the Post, because clearly you've sort of unloaded a real sense of just, it was a painful time for you, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it started with some of the social media behavior on the part of uh, certain people on the staff. and. And I thought it was creating problems for us. I thought that people were expressing opinions in a way that we we certainly wouldn't have put in in the newspaper or online or anything like that, uh, and that it would, didn't meet our standards uh, for what um, how we ought to be uh, comporting ourselves as journalists working for the Washington Post. And um, clearly, there were many people on the staff, particularly uh, people of a younger generation, who felt that they couldn't be one person at home and a different person at work. Uh, that particularly in a time like ours, where there were these attacks on uh, core values that I share, by the way, um, you know, of tolerance and non-discrimination and free press and free speech and all these sorts of things that, um, uh, that, we, that it was under attack. And so people um, felt they needed to express themselves on Twitter and elsewhere. And, um, and I felt that that wasn't helpful and it undermined our 
undermined our reputation, undermined our, the credibility of our journalism and public confidence. And I still, I, I still feel that way. And I think that people should, if I can, I mean, I, I think that people should think a little bit about why we have uh, editors and editing. Let's go back to the basics of our business a little bit. And, uh, you know, editors are, they have responsibility for um, the uh, organi organizing and the execution of our journalism. And, and they decide who should cover certain stories. And in, in concert with the people who are assigned to cover stories, they then uh, execute those stories. And they execute them uh, with the standards that have been well established here at the Washington Post. And if there are circumstances that are new, they talk about them among themselves and uh, sort it out as to what's the right, what's the right thing to do. It's a, collective, it's a collective process. And so, um, and um, so, and then we presumably produce journalism that actually is emblematic of our, our standards. Well, what happens if somebody who's not involved in that, somebody who hasn't been assigned to that story, particularly the most sensitive stories that we are working on, uh, then decides to just take it upon himself or herself to uh, uh, express their views on a particular story or to uh, decide that, well, the, you know, they're not covering the story right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set it right by, you know, tweeting out this particular piece of information in this particular way, uh, that kind of thing. And, uh, well, you know, the tweet never went through any, it doesn't go through any uh, formal review. Nobody, nobody, was, nobody was consulted on whether such a tweet should be sent out, whether we think the timing is right. Uh, and by the way, there's always this option that if you think the, the reporting is not, something needs to be included in what we've, uh, and what we've done, there's this odd little option that's like, go talk to your colleagues about it. You know, go talk to your, go talk to the editors, go talk to the reporters, uh, go across the room, assuming people are in the office, uh, and uh, go call somebody on the telephone, uh, go on Slack, uh, send an email. There are like multiple options for communicating with your colleagues about saying, look, sh isn't it about time we include this piece of information? Uh, that sort of thing. Or, by the way, there's a perspective. Or, by the way, I don't really agree with the language here. Or something like that. Rather than going on to Twitter and, and communicating to with your, presumably to your colleagues, what you think the story should be. Uh, and so that's, I think that's highly disruptive and highly corrosive to, the, uh, the, the, uh, to the, those established uh, journalistic standards that we were carefully cultivating with the editors, the reporters, everybody working on it, trying to produce the most careful story and then find something sort of out of the blue. Because I don't think that we should think of our newsrooms as being like a, a, a tennis ball machine that's just like, you know, propelling like, uh, this is a fact, here's a fact, by the way, here's a fact coming from all corners. That is not that's, that's not what the Washington Post is or should be. It's not what a reputable news organization should be. And, um, and, uh, and it, it just sort of blows up the whole process of um, creating a news report that reflects our best judge collective judgment about how we should cover stories and particularly the most sensitive stories. Well, obviously, though, social media is not going away. And it had put you, it did put you, felt generationally sort of at odds, essentially, with a great many of the younger staff. In the course of this, you know, keenly held principles of your own and, and, and of a great many people, of course, at the Washington Post, did you also learn anything from that generation in terms of incorporating any of that, uh, you know, new atmosphere, if you like, of reporting into how you uh, performed or would perform if you uh, were to edit something else? Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I think that there, you know, the fact that uh, the Post has a diverse staff, that we were endeavoring to have an even more diverse staff, uh, that's really helpful. I mean, I, the reality is, based on my life experience, I can't possibly know of certain stories. I can't see things from a perspective that somebody else with a very different background can see. Uh, so I think that's really, uh, that's really necessary, um, you know, to have racial diversity, ethnic diversity, diversity of life experience, diversity of like where people grew up, what colleges, kinds of colleges they went to, uh, you know, where in the kind of geographic diversity, whether people served in the military, I think it would be helpful given how long the United States has been, had, had been at war. Uh, that was, I think that was, that would be helpful. So there are a variety of things uh, that I think would be incredibly helpful uh, to mm -hmm. us and should be incorporated into, should be essential part of every, every newsroom. So do you, do you fear that you're out of date? 
I mean, do, 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 do you feel that, yes, you know, this is, this is how you view it, but that perhaps uh, there is another way of doing things? I mean, Wes Lowry, uh, you know, who was a fantastic reporter, but who then became more and more of a vexing issue for you, and you write about that uh, at length in the book, uh, he wrote in the Columbia Journalism Review that the press is engaging in performative neutrality, paint by the numbers balance, and thoughtless deference to government officials. How do you sort of respond to that? Because I suspect it might have been well, a first, you. Yeah, sure. Uh, so first of all, I mean, one, I do deal with that controversy on that, but I also talk about what a uh, talented and mm -hmm. courageous uh, and energetic and savvy uh, reporter he has and how he brought real honor to this organization uh, based on the stories that he did, uh, particularly on mm -hmm. police killings. So, um, um, and, I, and I believe all that. Uh, I just disagreed with him on social media behavior, but I don't think I, I believe it. I don't believe in performative neutrality. I mean, look, let me give you, let just give you a, a case study here, which predates my time at the Post. So the Catholic Church investigation that you mentioned that I launched when I was at the Boston Globe. Um, there, the problem was balance, okay? What did, what did the, what did the globe, ha globe have before I, before I launched that investigation? They had a column, that, or they basically they had the uh, lawyer for the plaintiffs, the, the, the people who had been abused as kids, uh, said that the cardinal himself was aware of the abuse and, um, and then con and reassigned a priest who had abused as many as 80 kids uh, so that he could abuse again and again without any notification to parishioners or the public or any, anything like that. And that the cardinal himself knew about this uh, and, and participated in that reassignment. And the archdiocese said that's absolutely not true. And that's where things were left. Well, that's balance, right? One said some, one thing and the other side said something else. And at my first meeting at the Boston Globe, I said, when nobody mentioned that story at the first meeting, I said, look, I wanna, what about this story? Um, um, can't we get beyond one side saying one thing and the other side saying something else? Can't we get to the truth of the matter? Uh, be, uh, because if it's true, it's an incredible scandal. And um, so what was that, okay? Uh, that was, I had a problem with the balance, okay? The, the issue was how do we find, how do we get to the truth? But in, in pursuing the truth, I want us to be open-minded. I want us to be fair. I want us to look at all of the evidence. I want us to be rigorous and comprehensive and thorough to go in without preconceptions of, of who's telling the truth in that instance and to look and to talk to everybody and look at every document we possibly can and to do, I know people, I like to use the word objective, other people don't, so, but the idea is open-minded, thorough, rigorous research to determine the truth uh, without letting your own preconceptions get in the way. And that's what, I, that's what I believe in, and that is not performative neutrality, and nobody, I believe, can point to anything I did here at the Washington Post that constituted performative neutrality. So would you sign up to the uh, Christian Amanpour maxim of truthful, not neutral? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. Yes, that would be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I hadn't heard it before, first one. And okay, I, well, it's a good right, one, I think. And so, I, yeah, okay. Anyway. Okay, so as we're sort of sitting here, um, it, you know, we've talked about the Post, but frankly, the news business across the board is, is really in a lot of peril. Credible news organizations are being gutted, you know, turned into skeleton ships. There are news deserts now all over the country with local journalism failing. The business model's been blown up. So. I mean, who do you blame for all of this? I mean, we, we tend to only blame digital disruption, but there's also cons uh, corporate consolidation, private equity firms, and you know, the, the news business also. Are we also to blame uh, for being slow to innovate, do you think, and for agreeing to give away content free for all of those decades, and then suddenly turning around and realizing they've eaten our lunch, essentially? I mean, do you feel now, uh, that we can ever rectify this, this great sort of giveaway of content? Uh, yeah, there's a lot in there. Uh, so in that question, um, look, I mean, I, I was at a din dinner last night and I said every mistake that could have been made, we made. Um, so um, um, we had a 100% record on making mistakes. Um, you know, uh, I think that we, we didn't take advantage of, I mean, there was a time where newspapers were considered to be uh, monopolies and duopolies, I mean, you know, news organizations today are writing about, you know, whether Amazon is a monopoly or whatever it is. Well, we were monopolies. <laughs> uh, that's the, and they, there were 40% to 50% profit margins in this business when these were publicly held companies. 
the problem is that the companies, they took that and gave it to their shareholders. Uh, they didn't invest in our future. They didn't recognize that, uh, that our business was fundamentally changing. When Craig Newmark came around and created Craigslist, uh, started to take away ca uh, classified advertising, did, how did the industry respond? Did, totally defensively, not doing anything that could possibly compete with, with, uh, with Craig Newmark because they were trying to protect their core business instead of actually innovating. And if it hadn't been Craig, it would have been somebody else that would have, would have done it. If we don't disrupt ourselves, we're just going to get disrupted. That's by somebody else. And so we sat there and did nothing. And, and we moved really slowly on, on becoming digital. There's a tremendous amount of resistance in our, in our business. Uh, I mean, I do say in the book that there's, in newsrooms, there's a gravitational pull to what used to be rather than what needs to be. And I really believe that. And every time you seem to make progress, we just like, people start slipping back to the way that it used to be. And it's incredibly, it's incredibly frustrating. And it's not just true of the newsrooms, by the way, it's true of the business side also. And, um, and so, you know, can we, um, can we recover? Well, we recovered pretty nicely here at the Post. Uh, we had six straight years of profitability. Um, we had the right strategy. I mean, I think that over time, you've got to ch change the strategy and you've got to adjust to the market. And, um, and uh, so I think there are a lot of things that still need to be done here at the Post. But, um, you know, as I like to say these days, not my problem anymore. But um, OK, well, um, that's a good place. So um, Je Jeff Bezos has the dictum. So somebody else's problem. Right. So Jeff they're Be all in this room. <laughs> Jeff Bezos has the dictum for the media. Be right, be riveting and ask people to pay. Yeah. I can't think of anything really more to add to that. Can you? Uh, no, I mean, I. I might add a few things, but, uh, you know, but I'm not going to, no, it was pretty good. I mean, if you had to boil it down, that's pretty good. All right. Well, Marty, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, congratulations on uh, collisions uh, of power. It is absolutely riveting. Couldn't put it down. Um, it's a remarkable record about leading this great storied news organization during a time of extraordinary turmoil. And how nice that you don't have to go back to work today, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you all of us, all of you for being here and, uh, and for you to being in person and online for watching and a reminder to get that book, Collision of Power. Thank you. Thank you.